Hello, welcome to Coffee Break with Microchip Technology. Coffee Break is our ongoing forum in which we discuss all manner of interesting things in the world of technology. I'm your host, Eric Glattfelter. Joining me today in the studio is Allison Brown. Allison, welcome back to the program. And as usual, would you give our audience an overview of how they can interact with us today during the live stream? Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. And good morning, everyone. We are currently streaming live on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So thanks for joining us. If you have any questions or want to participate in today's episode, you can leave your questions in the comments and chats, or you can send us an email to livestream at microchip.com. There will also be a brief survey available after this episode to get your thoughts on today's episode and see what you want to see coming up. So don't forget to fill that out, and we'll answer some of your questions at the end of the episode. Back to you, Eric. Thanks, Allison. All right, on to our topic. Trust Shield Platform Root of Trust. Today, as our subject matter experts, we have two guests in the studio Brandon Weekly, marketing engineer at Microchip, and Patrick Howard, senior VP of product and marketing at Kudelsky IoT. Brandon, Patrick, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good Thanks to be here. Us. Good morning, Eric. Great to see everybody in the studio. Uh, so let's get on to our topic. First of all, code security. What's going on in that space, and what does our audience need to be aware of, Brandon? Well, Code security almost sounds like something that only designers need to be aware of, but it's certainly something that everybody needs to be paying attention to. Um, we have uh, all kinds of threats that are out there uh, in the world, everything from scam phone calls to ransomware that you might be getting on your computer. Uh, so people need to, uh, if you're on the internet, you know you need to be aware of this type of threat and, and how to mitigate it. But one thing people might not realize or think about is what can happen to the firmware on your computer. Okay. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that happen in between the time that you push the power button on your computer, your phone, whatever platform you're using, and the time that you're actually able to get into the operating system and, and input things and tell it what to do. And the way the computer knows what to do uh, to get from that point A to point B, power on to, to operating system, is through that boot firmware. Uh, so there are a lot of a lot of hackers that are becoming more affluent with the their ability to compromise this firmware in different ways. They can shut down your system to make it completely uh, uh, unable to run. Uh, they can inject spyware so that you, they can just be stealing secrets in the background and you would never know. Um, and ultimately, they can affect your bottom line, and we certainly want to protect against that. So that has right. been. Uh, one big focus for us at Microchip and in my business unit is protecting that, that pre-boot environment, uh, but then also the firmware that helps us run during uh, past the boot phase during runtime. Okay. Now we have a family called uh, the Trust Shield family. Can you give us an overview of the feature set that is relevant? Yes, so the CEC 173X Trust Shield is a new root of trust controller that we have recently released. And um, compared to the other parts in uh, our portfolio, it focuses really on real time threats uh, more so than just what happens in the pre boot environment. And uh, again, from pressing the power button to getting into the operating system. So we do have a boot ROM that's capable of secure boot and secure updates, which is a pretty uh, ubiquitous standard uh, uh, across the board in the uh, in the market nowadays, uh, NIST 800-193 uh, certified. Um, but we uh, again, we're focusing on, a, on what can happen in the real time. So uh, say you're up and running and uh, somebody has might even have possession of your device. Mm -hmm. um, if they solder down a new spy flash and start injecting firmware in there once we're past secure boot, like how do we protect against that um, and similar types of attacks. So we have a, uh, a new spy monitor block that helps uh, watch the spy traffic in between your spy flash, which houses your firmware, and your application processor, which runs it. Uh, and we make sure that nothing illegal is happening. Um, we have a, uh, a new physically unclonable function, a puff uh, engine that, that exists that uh, supports our attestation feature. So if you have the application processor that wants to make sure that our part is actually legitimate, uh, it can do a call and response that's entirely encrypted, can only be answered correctly by our part using the puff. Um, to uh, so that it can identify itself. Um, and we have some side channel attack countermeasures that are also very important. So again, in a type of in-person attack where somebody might be leveraging the temperature parameters that the device is rated for so they can try to put a, a crack in the armor, as it were, uh, to try to harvest uh, secrets that way. Um, or um, uh, or they can do the same thing with, with the voltage, just try to over 
like overheat it with voltage and uh, try to try to pull some secrets out of it that way. So we have some countermeasures to protect against uh, against that type of thing as well. Okay, and uh, I guess the next step would be: Can you give us a an, an overview of what a root of trust subsystem might look like? How would that be implemented? Yeah. So here we have an example of a what we might see in a data center um, environment, that being one of our target markets. Um, so we, uh, with our 84 pin packages of both the CEC1736 and CEC1734, we're able to secure two QSPY lanes. Uh, so in parallel, you can secure two different application processors simultaneously. Um, in this example, we have a BMC um, and then we have a host CPU, both of which are having their boot secured through the boot ROM and then are able to take advantage of these real-time features as well. Um, as a note, we have a Soteria G3 firmware package, which is what we call our, our firmware that enables these, uh, these features that we have um, outside of Secure Boot and Secure Update. So, um, and we have some tools available that uh, our customers can use to configure the security to be specific to, to what their needs are. So how exactly you want Secure Boot to run, um, what exactly you want the spy monitor to be able to do, to, to, to monitor, to look at, to make sure we're, we're protecting from. Um, all that is highly customizable with some uh, easy use tools that we've been developing, um, available through our, um, uh, supported by our Soteria G3 firmware package. So this is, uh, again, what this might look like in a data center in, uh, example. Great, thanks. Okay, now we're talking about uh, security, so we always want some independent validation uh, of security, which is where Kudelski IoT enters the picture. So Patrick, when we say something is secure, uh, what does that really mean? <laughs> That's a great question, Eric. It means everything and nothing, depending on your <laughs> okay. background, your perspective. <laughs> uh, so what we do at, uh, at Kudelski IoT is in two steps. First, we will do a, what we call a paper assessment. So the first thing is setting expectation. You need mm -hmm. to define what we call the security target, where you want your product to, uh, to be security-wise. If you place the bar too low, you're going to end up with, a, I would say, a weak, potentially compromised uh, product. It end up in uh, reputation damage, angry customer, potential regulatory violation, and you don't want that. If you put the bar too high, uh, then this has some obvious cost implication for development, uh, timeline of your product release, and so on. So you really want to trade off and have the right security target. Uh, okay. So that's the very first thing. So you define that expectation. Uh, and then we look at all the threats that may apply around the product in the use cases that you want to uh, use those, uh, those products, uh, what uh, type of risk can happen, and how do you mitigate those risks. Okay. To do that, we, we will do a full architecture review. We will look at all the applicable regulation, potential need for certification, and in most of the case, uh, a code review. So that's the first step. Uh, then we really look at the product when it's, uh, it's ready, when engineering has done its job, uh, and we will do an evaluation on the product against the security target. And it's always important to keep that security target in mind. You don't want to overshoot or undershoot uh, your evaluation. Uh, to be able to answer is that secure or not, you need to be able to score or rate uh, the product, and uh, we're using framework for that, and in that case we use the uh, common criteria, which is widely accepted by the industry. Uh, and then we are uh, using a bunch of different type of attack from very basic to uh, much more advanced. Uh, in that case, we used a lot of fault injection. Mm -hmm. uh, and fault injection is really you, you, you do something on the chip to try to derail the code execution. You try to uh, have the chip ending in a situation which wasn't expected and maybe you can leverage that situation. Uh, and to do so, we have some basic voltage glitch injection. Uh, then we can go to much more advanced electromagnetic uh, uh, injection. And finally, playing with lasers, uh, which is really the, the fun part of, uh, of it. OK. So uh, in this case, in this specific case, what type of evaluation uh, was performed? So the objective was to uh, reach to, uh, what we call the enha enhanced basic. Uh, mm -hmm. So we did the, uh, the full threat assessment, look at uh, all the remediation, uh, did the vulnerability analysis, and uh, identified if we were uh, reaching the target, which the product is matching. So we are, on, uh, we are on target. Uh, so the main goal was to avoid some kind of low cost uh, fault attack and uh, most importantly leakage of uh, high value assets. Uh, so everything is fine, we look at the uh, countermeasure. It's always interesting to see if your countermeasure, if they exist, if they are efficient against the attack, which they are in that case. Uh, so everything was uh, apparently fine. 
Good. Well, that's good news. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about how it scored and uh, and some of the results? Yeah, sure. So on that slide, you have a you have an extract of the uh, of the report. So it's a typical uh, matrix of uh, impact of attack versus likelihood. So you really want to avoid to be in the uh, upper right corner. <laughs> sure. This is the uh, high uh, high impact, very uh, likely attack. You don't want to be there. Uh, that's the danger zone. Uh, in the case of that uh, product family, uh, we have one type of attack which might be problematic, but the uh, the likelihood is extremely low. Mm -hmm. uh, so the team agreed that that was a risk that uh, everybody could uh, could accept. Uh, so beyond that, everything is uh, is in the uh, safe zone. Uh, so we did a lot of side channel analysis of the uh, cryptographic engine, both on hardware and and the uh, boot ROM, uh, and uh, focused uh, a bit on the electromagnetic fault injection. Uh, but everything was uh, was fine and uh, reaching target. Very good, very good. Well, very interesting topic, and uh, obviously very uh, a lot a lot evolving in this space right now. Um, so I think that concludes kind of the main discussion, but uh, let's go to Allison and see if there are questions from the live audience today. Yes, we have a couple questions here. Let's go ahead and get started with this one, which is asking, you showed a data center example. Is this solution meant for other markets as well? So short answer to that is yes, uh, we do target other markets. Uh, data center is one of, uh, represents some of our, uh, most of the revenue, or not, not most of, but a lot of the revenue in our, in our business unit. So, uh, so it is uh, an important example for us to show, but we do have other markets that we work with um, as, as well, so, uh, such as um, uh, telecoms and industrial. Uh, we're trying to work our way into, uh, into automotive as well. So um, really the only, uh, the only requirement for the solution to work for you is that you have an external spy flash that houses your boot firmware and then you're booting, booting onto an application processor. So rather than having an on processor sp uh, flash where your uh, code is living, um, if uh, it must be an external spy flash and if that's the case then we're able to fit right in there and you can take advantage of the, uh, of the features. Great, thank you for that answer, Brandon. We'll move on to our next question here. This one is asking, do Kudelski's certifications apply to the end product or just this Trust Shield part? Yes, you can, uh, w what we did for uh, at the chip level, you can absolutely do exactly the same uh, process at the, uh, I would say at the bigger system, could be a, a device or an even a bigger end-to-end -end solution. So uh, we absolutely do, uh, do this, yes. Thank you. We do have another one here. How can Soteria firmware be accessed and what platforms is it compatible with? So the Soteria firmware is specific to the, uh, to the Trust Shield. It's not available to be used on any other platform. It's made specifically to enable the, uh, the, the features of this specific part. It is available when you purchase the product um, uh, via a software license agreement. Um, there's no extra fees involved there. Um, but uh, again, it does work specifically on the Trust Shield, the Generation 3 version of it that, uh, that we were talking about, so Soteria G3. There are previous generations of Soteria that work on previous generation hardware, um, but uh, again, this specific one works on the Trust Shield family, that being the CEC 1736 and CEC, CEC 1734. So that's what it's uh, limited to. Cool, thank you so much. And we do have another question here. This one's coming from the live stream email, livestream at microchip.com. Remember, you can always send us questions in there. So they're asking, are there any development boards or other tools that can be used with this part? Yes, there are. So if you head over to uh, microchip.com forward slash trust shield, you can see all the details of the different development tools um, that, that you have access to. We have a development board uh, that you can use to develop and evaluate with the part. Uh, we have several demos that are currently out that you can download from, uh, from the website that you can uh, just see some of the features in action. Uh, and we're coming out with new demos all the time, um, and we up the, update those to the website as they're available. So uh, you can just start by looking at a simple demo. How, what is this trying to do? How does it work? How quick is it? Um, which, in, in general, it is extremely fast. So um, it's nice to be able to, again, see that in action. So we, we have that development board. We have those demos that are coming out. Um, and then we also have a GUI uh, that uh, is mentioned on the website that you can download that you can use to provision the part um, and, again, customize the um, uh, the feature set to your needs. 
All right, thank you so much for answering those questions. That's gonna wrap up our questions for today. To our audience, thank you for tuning in. If you do have another question that comes up or we didn't get to yours, please feel free to shoot us an email at that live stream at microchip.com email. Also, please take the short survey that's provided in the description below. You can find it at microchip.com slash trust shield survey. And we really appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in today and we'll see you next time. Back to you, Eric. Thanks so much, Allison. Brandon, Patrick, uh, thank you for sharing your expertise on the episode today. Of and course. most importantly, thank you to our audience for taking some time out of your schedule to join us today. That's a wrap on our current season of Coffee Break. We'll be resuming in October. I think the date is October 19th. Please visit us at microchip.com slash coffee break. And uh, there you will see updates of the schedule as it's posted. You can sign up for subscriptions, you can add events to your calendar, and you can peruse our library of previously hosted Coffee Break sessions. So um, please take a look at it, and we hope to see you in October. Thank you.